Welcome to Reading Rural, y'all, where we talk about all things rural YA literature and to the rural authors who write it. I'm your host, Dr. Shay Parton, and I'm excited to talk to you about today's topic at hand. If you're a teacher, student, or community member in a rural community, my hope is that the content here honors you and your experiences by discussing and analyzing books that can serve as a mirror for you. If you're an urban or suburban teacher, student, or community member, this series is for you too, and I hope that it can provide nuance to the stereotypical depictions of rural people so often seen in popular media. So come on in, and let's get to it. Hello and welcome to a beautiful fall day here in Central Texas. I think tomorrow we will return to Hotham, but for right now, um, it's a good fall day, lots of crisp air, and perfect for talking about spooky books and mysteries for spooky season. I am here to talk with you today um, in this episode about some teaching ideas I had and some activities you might want to do with Dark and Shallow Lies, which is perfect again because this is spooky season. If you didn't watch the first episode in this series, I highly recommend going back and watching that so you know a little bit more about what the book is about. Um, But for now, let's get into some teaching ideas. I wanted to say one thing also before we started talking about these ideas. Um, I see these videos as like little mini brainstorms about what I'd do if I had students working with these books. I know they're not full lesson plans with connections to standards or anything, but it's how I would start the planning process anyway. Knowing sort of, you know, in backwards design, what I want students to be able to do at the end of interacting with this book, and then thinking about the activities that could get us there. So I hope that this gives you all some inspiration. Um, and in this case, if you're looking for something more detailed and concrete, you can pop on over to Rethink ELA and purchase a whole unit dedicated to reading and writing spooky stories, um, that I wrote in partnership with them. And, um, this novel would be perfect for that. So even outside of spooky season, if you want to teach, um, a spooky genre, whether it's horror or the Gothic or whatever, that unit would be perfect for that. Um, so check it out. If you're looking for inspiration, then I have a couple here. I've noticed as I edit these videos that the way I read the opening pages is often not exactly how they're written. Uh, That is, I want to read them in my particular rural language variety, so I drop G's even though they're not dropped in the text. I insert words where they aren't actually there. I'll use affixes like, uh, like for example, a coming, you know, they're a coming or they're a watching or, you know, whatever. Um, And... If it's too bad, I scrap the initial recording and I redo it to use one that's more accurate to what the author actually wrote. If you're interested to hear more about this, I wrote about it over on Dr. Bickmore's Why Wednesday, and I'll put the link in the description so you can check it out. Throughout Dark and Shallow Lies, there are characters who use rural language varieties specific to Louisiana. So these are Cajun or Acadian varieties of English. While they don't use this way of speaking throughout the whole text, um, it is featured more than once, and um, Jenny Meyer Sane does a really good job of explaining like what it would sound like to a listener, as well as um, describe the features and, and kind of where they come from, or, or just that they are particular to this region of Louisiana. Um, so I got to thinking about how students could inquire into their own language practices using... Dark and Shallow Lies as sort of a spring bu- springboard for that. <laughs> Knowing that Jenny Meyer Sane has a heart for all things theater, I think I'd do some kind of inquiry into language practice through dramatic readings of the text, which would look something like this. Students would pick a passage that speaks to them in some way, Um, one that they particularly like or they think is particularly important to the text. And then I would have them really dive into the emotion, the tone, and the mood of that passage and prepare a dramatic reading of it. So almost as if they were reading it um, for the audiobook recording. Um, I would encourage them to read it how they feel it rather than how they see it on the page. You could use any number of my readings of the books I've talked about on Reading Rule Y'all as examples. Um, Then I would have students read the passage aloud and record it. After they record it, I'd have them listen back to it while reading along in the print text, and then ask them to take notice of what they said versus what's on the page. How is it different? What felt 
unnatural or natural to do and say while reading it? And why do they think that is? And then what does it reveal about their particular English variety? Because everybody speaks a variety of English, whether it's um, sort of white mainstream middle class English, whether it's, um, you know, sort of the English of the academy. Um, there are lots and lots of different varieties of English. And so how does the way that they want to say what's on the page differ from what's actually on the page? And what does that mean about how we think about language and how we um, ascribe power to different versions of English? So anyway, that's what I would do to have them think about that. Um, the second activity that I would do with students has to do with the connections between place and identity. So we know that La Cachette is the self-proclaimed psychic capital of the world and that this identity of the town is shaped by individuals in the town as well as shapes those individuals' identities. So it's kind of a reciprocal process. So I'd want students to think about the identity of their town and how it influences and shapes uh, the identities of of them, of themselves, and the rest of the folks who live there. So that would kind of look like this. I'd ask, if you were to name our town um, to be the self-proclaimed capital of the world, what would our title be? And then um, this could be a journal entry or a more involved process where students get out in the town to get a sense of its identity and then use those experiences as evidence in their claim of the town's identity. So it could actually take the form of an argumentative piece or a narrative essay, narrative nonfiction. There, there's a lot of different ways you, you could take this, but the, the central question would be if we were the self-proclaimed capital of the world of something, um, what would we be? Would we be like the self-proclaimed corn capital of the world? Would we be the self-proclaimed, um, you know, mountaineering capital of the world? Would we be, um, the self-proclaimed fishing capital of the world? Like what about the, the geography? What about the town? Um, you know, what would we, what would be our claim to fame as the capital of the world? So, um, that's what I would do for that. And both of these sound really fun, and I would love to write an entire unit about this book um, and ask students to engage with it because I think it generates a lot of important questions, and um, it's just a really great read. So I highly recommend that you pick it up if you haven't already. If you want to get a copy, hop on over to our bookshop.org storefront um, where we'll get a little bit of the proceeds of your purchase. Uh, to help keep this viable for me um, as a project. And um, if you get a minute, I'd love to know what you think about these ideas. Um, if you could leave a comment about which you like best or any variations you could see yourself and students enjoying, um, that would be great. I would love to see those ideas. And we could build a community of practice around these books if you wanted to make it a, a you know, a habit <laughs> as you watch these videos to say, what you're excited about trying with students. It was good to see y'all. I'm glad you were here. I hope you have a great rest of the day and I hope you enjoy some fall weather where you are, whatever that looks like and however it feels. Well, I hope y'all enjoyed this week's episode. If you like what you heard and want to support the show and keep it a viable endeavor for me, it'd be great if you would like and comment on the YouTube episode. You could talk about what you liked most or what you walked away with. It'd also help if you'd subscribe to the channel. You can also head over to the Support Us page on the Literacy in Place website. There you can learn about all the different ways you can support this work. Like, you can like and follow the website itself, find out where to engage with us via social media, and go leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Or you could shop our storefront on bookshop.org to get the book featured in this episode or any other books that catch your eye. You could also buy us a coffee at coffee.com and donate once or set up a recurring donation. All of this would be immensely helpful in keeping this show going. So thanks a bunch for doing what you can. Well, that's it for this episode. Until next time, y'all come back now, would you? <laughs>